Hello, hello, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as ever, am your host, Simon Wemmers here. One of our writers, Katie, thank you, Katie, has written me a script, The Sally House, America's Most Haunted. <laughs> Oh, let's decode that right away. There's no such thing as hauntings because ghosts are not real. We've discussed this, but maybe this will finally be the episode where I'm like, oh no, turns out they are real. This is the one that convinced me. Uh, no. I'm always, like, I say that sarcastically, but I am very much open to being convinced. Just if it's a, it's a high bar to convince me that ghosts are real because it's just, I mean, just good luck proving that one because if there was proof ghosts are real, people would be like, the it would be a whole different world. We'd be like, oh my god, okay, this changes everything. Uh, but they aren't. Let's carry on. Atchison, Kansas probably doesn't ring a bell for most people. If you've heard of it, it might be in regards to being the birthplace of Amelia Earhart. Never heard of it, no. The house she was born in is now a museum, located on North Terrence Street in this small city. A mere pointy miles away, however, at 508 North 2nd Street, you'll find what's become known as the Sally House. And what's so special about this place, you may ask? Well, guess what, Simon? This is an episode about ghosts, and not just ghosts. The Sally House has a reputation as one of the most haunted, if not THE most haunted house in America. I want to go there now. I want to go there and be like, yeah, okay, show me these ghosts. And then I'll become haunted or whatever, and I'll be like, wow, that was the proof I needed. All that needed, all that needed to happen was for me to become haunted. And I sat through a whole hour-long feature about this, and so now you get to hear all about it too. Let's get into it, shall we? Oh god. I do enjoy the episodes where it's I know it's bad because there'll be like people watching this be like, Simon, don't be so close-minded, blah, blah, blah. But I do love it when Katie's also on side with me. Because <laughs> Katie's a little probably less skeptic than I am, I would say, having read her scripts and stuff. But, you know, it's still pretty like I had to sit through this hour-long story about ghosts. I love it when we sh** on this together. Let's go. And here we go. The slightly nebulous history of the Sally House. What are the ingredients of a good haunted house backstory? Well, death. Obviously, preferably in a violent or tragic way, if a child's imbo involved, so much of the creepier. <laughs> Moving objects, cold spots, unexplained electrical phenomena, apparitions, and actual contact between the living and the dead are the sorts of things that you'll be looking for when making a trip to a haunted house. And the Sally House hits everyone. How about some photographic and video evidence? Well, check and check again, my friends. Oh, I'm so skeptical. It's like video evidence. Yes, but uh, no. Even though the history behind the paranormal activity associated with the house is kind of open for debate with more than one origin story floating around, it is generally agreed that there is someone or something haunting the place. So let's go back a little bit and find out about the most popular version of how the ghost came to be. <laughs> Let me guess, violence? Children? <laughs> Uh, what's it gonna be this week? Back in the 1800s, Dr. Michael Finney bought a couple of plots of land on North 2nd Street and ended up building two houses there, numbers 504 and 508. 508 was finished in 1870, with Dr. Finney unfortunately dying only two years later. I'm not sure about 504, but number 508 at least remained in the Finney family for decades after. Early in the 20th century, Finney's son Charles, another doctor, was living and working in number 508. The whole downstairs of the place was set up like a doctor's office with personal living areas on the upper floor. In the middle of the night, sometime in 1906, the doctor was woken by a frantic knocking at the door. Opening up, he was met with a frightened mother holding her young daughter in her arms. This little girl was suffering from horrendous stomach pains, which Dr. Finney Jr. was quick to diagnose as acute appendicitis. What year was this? Early 20th century? That's gonna be risky <laughs> like appendicitis today is that like, yeah you go to hospital what what they chop it out you sit in hospital for a few days take some antibiotics bada bing bada boom you're all good a friend of mine here my brother-in-law they've all had appendicitis and it seemed like yeah it's a bit miserable it's painful then they cut it out it's a bit painful recovery from surgery but you're all good back in the day it'd be like okay well we gotta go for some very risky surgery we're not really sure about you know whether you're gonna recover from this you might get an infection and just die Wow. I think they'd nailed down the part about washing their hands at this point, though, which is that that's at least nice. Knowing time was short, he hurried the girl to a table, but the tale differs slightly here. Either knocked, he either knocked the ether over in his haste, or didn't allow it long enough to take effect before deciding to operate. Either way, he attempted an appendectomy with no anesthetic on a young child, which ended up with her dying in agony. 
Since then, the spirit of the girl, who was later identified as Sally, has haunted the house, behaving in a hostile manner towards men in particular, which I guess is pretty understandable. Wait, how is it understandable? It's like, yeah, you're hostile towards the guy who was trying to save your life. It's not like he was doing this for fun. He's not like, ah, oh, no, we don't need to wait for the ether. It's like, well, we'll just carry on straight away. No, it's because there's a mega rush, because your appendix is going to explode. And if your ap appendix explodes inside your body in the early 20th century, now, you might die from infection afterwards, but if that happens, if that happens, you are <laughs> You're dead. You are dead. Bop, boop, beep, bop, bop, boop, bop. You're dead. Another variation on the story is that Sally and her mother actually roomed in the house, so were already very familiar with Dr. Finney, and that Dr. Finney was incompetent and had botched the operation or misdiagnosed Sally. Yet another version is that Dr. Finney had an affair with an African-American woman, shock horror, and Sally was their illegitimate child. Wow, that is a completely different story on a completely different timeline. How about that? We don't really know where the ghost came from. What a surprise! Because it's probably just a made-up story that whoever owns this house fabricated in order to make a little money. It's always money. <laughs> When she became too ill for him to help, he refused to take her to the hospital, resulting in her death. Sally's mother then attacked him and either killed, and he either killed her, or she died by accident. This left two spirits, a woman and a child, haunting the house at 508 North 2nd Street. The Pickmans. Okay, we're now in the early 1990s. The house is owned by Mr. Leslie Smith, and he's renting it out for the first time to a married couple called Tony and Deborah Pickman. If you're interested in what was happening in the world in 1993, according to Hobbylark.com, Okay. There were a grand total of around 25 websites online at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, there were 623, including my fave, the IMDb, or the Internet Movie Database. Wait, is that true? 30 years ago, there were only 623 websites. 30 years is a long-ass time. But it's also, like, crazy. Six. It's amazing, isn't it? How far we've come. The total cost of a 30 second Super Bowl ad was $850,000. In 2022, a Super Bowl commercial cost $223,000 per second. Which, I mean, that is a lot of money. But that also seems quite reasonable. Like a four second Super Bowl ad would cost you a million dollars. One. Like, one, two, three, four. That's quite a lot of time to get in front of quite so many people. Beanie Babies and Goodfellas Frozen Pizza were launched, as well as Pepsi Max. Love Pepsi Max. And a cereal called Sprinkle Spangles. And one of these products didn't make it. <laughs> Pete Sampras and Steffi Graf dominated the tennis world, and Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. In amongst the faux fur, Birkenstocks, and grunge looks that were popular in the early 90s, Tony and Deborah Pickman and their infant son moved into their new place in Atchison, Kansas. They were not aware of its spooky history, and neither, apparently, was their landlord, Leslie Smith. Over the course of their tenure in the Sally House, which lasted just under two years, the Pickmans bore witness to numerous strange events, some of which were later documented by film crews. So, what kind of things are we talking about here? As I mentioned earlier, I watched the whole blooming hour long feature about this, which is most unlike me, I have to say. I looked it up afterwards and then got a 4.1 on IMDb. <laughs> that is bad. IMDb is weird though, because I swear everything's like a 6 or a 7. You could be like, yeah, what's The Godfather? Ah, like 6.9. And uh, what's like, um, should be part 7? Oh, it's like a, it's like a 5.1. <laughs> They all seem to cluster. I mean, unless it's really bad. They all seem to cluster in that range, right? Maybe I should have picked something else. Indeed. The Pickmans were in it, explaining their experiences firsthand, and there were shots of photos taken and some video footage, too. Not that I'm any judge of character whatsoever, but they seemed like normal, matter of fact people. After having experienced some weird stuff in their new place, they brought in psychics and mediums. <laughs> They brought in psychics and mediums to try and get some answers, and eventually one of these psychics hooked them up with the big guns of paranormal programming such as unsolved mysteries and sightings. So, here's their story. And always remember, people can be super reasonable, because it's often not about people lying or making stuff up and all of this stuff. It's there being another explanation for why they saw or heard the things that they did. One of these things could be mental illness. If there's two of them, then it could be something environmental. And we always come back to my classic favorite, carbon monoxide. If you don't have a carbon monoxide in detector in your house, get one. As soon as possible! because that's the sort of thing that causes hallucinations and you for you to like hear things and see things that aren't really there and it's super common and it will also kill you one of the first things the pickmans experienced in the sally house was your standard creepy occurrence of a load of stuffed animals being placed in a circle around their baby's room once having confirmed that nobody in the house had done it they put toys the toys back and went downstairs <laughs> this sounds like this is just the dude though isn't this just the dude <laughs> 
That was me like, oh my god, have you seen the toys? The wife would go, did you put those there? No, it's a ghost. <laughs> Is this all sh <laughs> Or like my kid would draw a picture and then I'd draw like... <laughs> I'm such <laughs> I'd tell my wife afterwards, but I'd be like, did you see that? Did you see that drawing our daughter drew? And she'd be like, what do you mean? And I'd be like, just have a look at it. And I'll have drawn like loads of blood into the scene or something just for a laugh. And she'll be like, you did that, didn't you? And I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But someone who's just a bit more of a dick than me, I feel would do that. I'd just be like, no, our kid's haunted. <laughs> They're going to be a serial killer. Uh, the lights went out briefly, and after they came back on, the Pikmins ventured upstairs to find the toys once more in a circle on the floor. How weird or made up. And, uh, after a few other occurrences of electrical weirdness, cold spots, and pictures mysteriously being hung upside down, Tony's brother was around one day and decided to bait the spirit of the house a bit. Placing a teddy bear on the table, Tony's brother got a camera and announced that if the goat was wanted to do anything, he was ready to take a picture of it. Right on cue as he pressed the button, the teddy bear began to spin around on the spot. The photo came out as a picture of a room with an odd light blurred patch in the middle. There were several photos taken in the house that show strange dark patches or weird light portions in various rooms, and there's also a photo of a candle with wax that had melted upwards past the wick. After the spinning bear incident, the family freaked out a bit and decided to go and stay with Tony's mother for the night. As they were leaving, Tony felt a strange sensation on his back, which didn't go away, and when Deborah checked later, he had three long scratches, they were also, which they also photographed. This was the first time Tony was attacked by the ghost in the house, but unfortunately for him, it wouldn't be the last. Okay, now we're drifting from... Like, because ghosts aren't real, right? Now we're drifting from just like, uh, you know mental illness carbon monoxide or whatever to be like spinning tails and i'm not sure if this is like unsolved mysteries or whichever piece of sh history show has decided to pick up on this or whether it's these people just making up a story for the the laughs but coming from a position of ghosts obviously not being real it's like who faked this stuff then due to Atchison being a small place the pikmans didn't want to get a reputation as weirdos or kooks for going on about their haunted house they also didn't want the embarrassment of local media attention so they enlisted the help of a co-worker's relative called barbara connor she was a psychic and been living in california so had no knowledge of or ties to the house and could investigate without causing a load of local gossip she quickly located the spirit of a young girl and attached the name Sally to her for the first time, thus creating the nickname of the Sally House. So much for keeping everything under the radar, however, as the feature goes on to say, with Barbara's connections to California, it wouldn't be long before film crews were beating a path to the little town in the prairie. Oh god, here we go. Hey, I live in California, and nobody's racing to document where I've just been. Shows like Unsolved Mysteries and Sightings contacted Barbara to get them in with the Pikmans, and yes, I can see Simon nodding along here as the monetary aspect starts coming into view. Yes, it does. It's always about the money. I'm saving my poo-pooing for the end, though, so here's the rest of the story. The day before the first crew filmed anything, property owner Leslie Smith did a walkthrough of the house. In the feature, he says he doesn't believe in the supernatural and didn't think the house was haunted in any way. As a joke, he spoke out loud to the ghost before he left and said something like, Sally, if you're there and you don't want them filming you, just give me a call, okay? Give me two rings twice so I know it's you. Goodbye now. He wrote down his number and left it by the phone as you do oh my god what is he setting up here <laughs> could it be that the cult they're gonna call he's gonna get the two rings oh my god who would ever who would ever guess this so yeah i guess what happens later that day his phone starts ringing and stops after two rings before he can pick up he had kind of forgotten his earlier instructions but then when the phone rang twice again he stopped and suddenly remembered picking up the receiver all he could hear was some static he called a handy priest friend who told him not to get involved any further to carry out anything he'd promised the spirit and then just leave it the hell alone smith told the film crew that they could film for one day but then they had to leave he didn't try talking to sally again wait his priest friend was like dude do what do what the spirit says what the spirit wanted to be let he's let be left alone and he's like okay you could film just one day okay just one day this isn't non-fiction this isn't non-fiction just when you watch these shows it's fake you know that right it's not real the crew for the show sightings ended up coming to the sally house five times over the two years that the pikmans were there and strange things did indeed occur tony pikman would suddenly be covered in scratches ranging for a few on his arm to a whole mass across his chest and stomach and some long deep ones on his back tony tony it's like beat me <laughs> These are not like marks that he could have done just before. They are proper nasty looking scratches. When I well I didn't see the clip in question, there is apparently a nine minute sequence of uncut footage showing scratches forming on his skin from nowhere. 
Uh, there is? Okay. Well, why haven't you seen it? Probably because it's not real. I said what I said. As and always. I'm not changing on it, okay? That. I said what I said. It ain't changing over here. Eventually, Tony started seeing apparitions of a young girl dressed in old-fashioned clothes. He drew her one day, and his wife agreed that this must be Sally. Tony definitely bore the brunt of the hauntings, as he also started hearing scratching in the walls and sounds like furniture being dragged around, although Deborah didn't seem to hear the same things. Then one day, he was lying down trying to rest, and a lady wearing black lace gloves materialized before him and shot out a hand, saying, I'm gonna... And then she disappeared, leaving poor old Tony scared shitless. Things Tony need to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Tony needs to get that carbon monoxide protector. Things finally came to a head when Tony became worried over his wife Deborah's safety. It sounds like you need to be worried about your own safety, mate. Deborah seems fine. You're the one with big scratches on your body. In the feature, he says, I would watch her getting ready for work, and the whole time I'm thinking, I just want to hurt her. I wanted to stab her, to be honest with you. That was the thought going through my mind. Uh oh. <laughs> Tony, someone keep an eye on Tony. Yikes, Deborah, you better run. Luckily, instead of killing his wife or going on to marriage counseling, the Pickmans finally moved out. At some point in the intervening years, other evidence of bad stuff happening at the Sally House came to light. A pentagram was found on the basement floor, along with other evidence of satanic signs and rituals. A bloody sweater was found in the attic, and a luminol test confirmed evidence of blood spray in a closet. Kate Peltzer, who lived in the house next to the Sally House, said that when she went into the basement to check it out with a group of researchers, bricks were dropped on them. There weren't any bricks in the basement. She also said, well, there obviously were, because they were dropped on you, weren't they? She also said her young son had a room that was facing a bedroom in the Sally House. He would get scared at night and point at what he says was a black monster flying around his room. Yes, but he has a kid who is scared of the haunted house next door because you told him it was haunted. Many years later, the Pickmans visited the Sally House again with a psychic friend, and this time they looked around for a bit. Tony was thrown backwards with such force that his lace-up shoes flew off. He couldn't get up off the floor until their psychic friend told the spirit to let him go in the name of God. After this incident in 2009 or so, the Pickmans teamed up with EVP expert and paranormal investigator Michael Esposito and a couple of new psychic mediums, including Canadian Robbie Thomas, who is apparently quite a big cheese in the world of psychics. EVP? Okay, good. Someone's getting you know, stands for electronic voice phenomenon and is where people go around with some form of electronic audio recording device and you can sometimes capture brief ghostly noises and voices on them allegedly you know when there's just the noise of static and then a horrible cackle breaks out and you hear a deep voice saying worship satan or whatever anyway esposito is filming the pikmins and a medium during a seance with the lights off the medium has made contact with an adult woman and is asking whether she wants them to bring a priest to the house. When you see Tony suddenly scoot backwards and almost swear, although he does remember he's on camera, so he tries to cover it up. He then says, It burns. The lights go back on. Tony lifts up his shirt for the umpteenth time, and you see a bald patch where his hair has been singed off and a mark starting to form. Esposito mentions there's a burning smell in the air. Okay, that's pretty intense. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. Yeah, like, how does that happen? That's curious to me. The psychic medium Robbie Thomas walks around the house, and in his opinion, he can sense at least two young girls, and there is also the presence of something more menacing and probably male. He thinks that Sally refers not to a child, but to the doll of a child. He gets the names Emily and Anna from the house. He also brings his spirit-sensitive dog to the house, and it point-blank refuses to enter one of the bedrooms. Other people, including Deborah Pickman, have also theorized that it is indeed a malevolent demon in the house masquerading as a little girl. But what should we make of all of this? Can we make a clear judgment one way or the other? Well, judgment between whether it's a demon or a little girl, how about it's nothing? I'm very curious about the, the singeing chest, though. That's quite clever. How did they pull that off? It's on camera, right? Wait, am I delusional? I bet the footage doesn't actually show any singeing. It's just something that could have been done before. And the guy's like, smells of burning flesh. And you know what we can't smell on video? Well, smells at all. Let's get to the poo-pooing. Listen, I'm a pretty accepting person, but when weird things come along, I generally tend to look for ways in which they might be a hoax or fake or a misunderstanding, etc. While there does seem to be a lot of compelling evidence for a real-life haunting at the Sally House, there are definitely things that I, as a very amateur investigator, can poke a few holes in. Simon's probably already covered some of these as well, but here goes nothing. 
Yes, here we go. Number one. Why hasn't any reports of ghostly behavior come out prior to the Pickmans living there in 1993? Apparently, the tenants before the Pickmans had said that they were aware of Sally and that their daughter had called her an imaginary friend. There's not much more detail than that, though, so either they're making it up after the fact or they just experienced a few odd bumps and flickers and put it down to just a generic ghost in the house. <laughs> Is that, oh no 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 that yeah that house there are some people who are just so blase about what i just think is just um and not ignorance but um just nonsense they're like oh yeah no that house like my old house was definitely haunted definitely no doubt and it's not not open for question or anything it's just like yeah no it, it was it was there were ghosts there were many ghosts it's like people who are like yeah no well 9 11 it was definitely an inside job yeah it was it was trust me it's like <laughs> Stop with this, please. The landlord, Leslie Smith, was also not aware of any goings on. I read that the Pickmans were his first tenant, so presumably he bought the house after the other tenants moved out, maybe not giving him any time to acquaint himself with the resident ghost before renting the place out again. Either Sally really had something against the Pickmans, or they're just making the whole thing up. Number two, why didn't they leave earlier? The Pickmans, and especially poor old Tony, were subjected to a barrage of supernatural attacks shortly after they moved in. Why did they stay for two years? If weird scratches start appearing on my body and my candles are melting upwards, losing the deposit is the last thing I'd be thinking about. Cynically speaking, maybe they only stayed while the TV people were still interested. Is that right? Could that be it? Could it be to do with money? Oh, what a shock. Number three, the good timing of the TV crews. After his initial back scratches, I think the only time Tony Pickman was attacked was when there was a camera crew there. And for the couple who initially said they wanted no publicity because of embarrassment, they sure were featured on a lot of TV shows, including as recently as 2015 in an episode of Ghost Adventures, which I just found out is fronted by Zach Bagans, who we made a bit of fun about in the James Dean Curse Car episode. Hi, Zach. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> I didn't even record that not that long ago. <laughs> Zach Bagans, who are you? Number four. Some things in the documentary that I have issues with. Michael Esposito, the paranormal investigator, is featured quite heavily in the documentary. However, he relates things from the Pickman story that he had no first-hand knowledge of, such as a rose that was found burning on the table. He wasn't there to see it. He just apparently knows about it from the Pickmans. He tells stories of things that happened to them, but without them also being there, so who knows how much is true or exaggerated. Also, in his footage of the seance, the medium is communicating with the spirit and asking it questions, but she's sitting at the back of the shot, kind of out of the way, and the camera is aimed squarely at Tony Pickman, handily catching his reaction as his stomach is apparently burned. Oh, okay, yeah, it's like this. It's probably not a multi-camera setup thing, is it? Or if it was, they could have had a camera on him and a camera on her, and then they chose to cut to him. But I haven't seen this. I assume Katie has seen that, and she'd probably have you know told me about that if that was what was happening on the footage it's actually hard to see the singe mark that they're pointing out although it does look like his hair is disappearing we hear esposito say that the sulfur smell they smelled earlier must have been the burning hair is this just a case of them narrating what we're supposed to believe mm -hmm, perhaps after the initial shock it seems like it's all over and tony just lies back in relief and is all smiles which is a weird reaction if you ask me if my body hair just started burning off for no reason i'd be freaking out for a lot longer than a couple of seconds the footage is quite bad quality so it's really hard to be sure of what we're looking at so we can't say for certain if anything really happens or not yeah it's always like any of these things is always like why is the quality so bad why is it so grainy it's never good quality it's never like we got 4k oh this is what back in the day so maybe it was that's an excuse but nowadays it's still like it's still all bad quality it's still not very good and it's like we got for like 4k 8k cameras and stuff it should always be good quality. Moving on to Robbie Thomas, the psychic medium. It says in the documentary that he always does a walkthrough of any house that he's asked to look at the day before any official reading is carried out. Hmm, why is a pre-reading walkthrough necessary if you're a psychic? Cynics among us might think that he's getting the lay of the land to provide a more believable session the next day. He didn't really add much to the story, just confirmed cold spots in the presence of a young child. He also threw the names Emily and Anna around later, but these are pretty meaningless as no violent deaths have ever been officially recorded at the Sally House, so they can't be attached to anyone in the historical record. He also says there's a lot of orb activity which is related to psychic activity, but he actually says, quote, So this to me is a bunch of orbs. I've got my eyes closed and I can see maybe 10, 12 different kind of orbs. Uh, hello, you've got your eyes closed. I can see a kind of red landscape with my eyes closed, but I don't assume that I'm looking at Mars. 
Yes. Also, just this dude adds nothing. He's not even like one of these clever mediums where it's like, you know, they cold read you and then tell you stuff based on like, he's walked through the house the day before. At least try and pretend to like do some fake stuff. Like pretend, like learn something and then use it. Number five, the EVP stuff. As previously mentioned, EVP stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. It's one of those branches of paranormal activity that can't really be ruled out or, or ruled in as evidence of ghosts. Michael Esposito takes a few recordings around the Sally House, which are in the documentary, handily subtitled, so we know what we're supposed to be listening for. Yeah, this is one of those crazy things. It's like, if you subtitle something that's like not really audible, it, you the people who are listening to it will hear what the subtitles say and they'll be certain about it there's some cool youtube videos where people do this and then they're like okay listen to this recording what do you hear and you're like i don't hear anything okay listen to this recording and here's the subtitles and then they play the same recording with different subtitles but don't tell you and you're like yeah i totally heard the whatever the subtitle was saying it's crazy you just apply what you're being told is being said to it one such instance is a voice allegedly saying he's the devil which i could not make out at all and i've got quite good hearing there are a few other things generally alluding to some powerful male being but evp can be explained by a human's tendency to try and find patterns and meanings where there are none it's also possible that perfectly normal signs were picked up in the ambient noise that came from sources other than the spirit realm. To be honest, I had a hard time picking out what those voices were supposed to be saying, and it's extremely open to interpretation. As a slightly odd side story, I remember sending a video of a breast pump that I was using to my sister, as it sounded like the machine was saying, here I go, here I go, here I go, over and over again, which it obviously wasn't, but once you heard it, it was impossible to... Yeah, that's amazing. Here I go, here I go, here I go! <laughs> I mean, it's doing it. It's doing. I'd get attached to that breast pump. I'd be like, oh, you know, it's just motivated. It's going for it. Good breast pump. Good breast pump. Number six, the weird basement. Okay, signs of a pentagram and satanic rituals were apparently found, but that's about as much information as I can find about it. Who knows when the pentagram was originally drawn? It could have been at any time before, during, or after the Pikmin's tenure. I imagine that the time that that pentagram was drawn was probably the time they realized that it's going to make them a little bit of money. <laughs> They're like, let's just go down to the basement and carve a big pentagram on the wall because uh, that's going to look haunted and shit. Cool. Michael, allegedly, Michael Esposito takes a group of ghost hunters into the basement uh, for a look-see and starts rabbiting on about someone being a witch. Who's he talking about? Sally, a previous occupant, the ghost lady. There's a black mark on the floor and Esposito says that there was a pentagram underneath, but Leslie Smith, the house's owner, covered it up. We don't hear anything from Leslie about this, so I have no idea if it's true. The blood found in the closet is creepy, but again, I'm having a hard time finding much more detail about it. This seems like an added on part of the story, not part of the main ghostly narrative, and I can't really find out much about it, so let's just leave it there. Sounds made up, to be honest, doesn't it? Number seven, the book. Deborah Pickman published a book in 2010 called The Sally House Haunting. Oh my god, what? Did she make money from this book? Is that possible? Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. Some unexpected revelations came out that weren't really touched on in the documentary. These included the fact that the Pickmans were told by psychic Barbara Connor to treat the ghost of little Sally as an adopted daughter, so they left out toys and crayons for her, and basically just got on with living in a haunted house and treated her like an invisible child. That is super weird. Deborah also believed that Sally was her baby's guardian angel. Baby Pikmin would wake up all the time, which is a nightmare for parents, but Deborah came to believe that Sally was intentionally waking him up to protect him from sudden infant death syndrome, which is totally impossible to prove, so, well, there's that, I guess. What the hell was that? Um, okay. <laughs> or your kid's just waking up in the night because they're a kid. Anyway, this is a new aspect of their relationship with the ghost that isn't usually part of the haunted house story. The book came out years after they'd left the house, but then a few years on again, Deborah is now changing her tune on a new TV show, saying that she believes the ghost was a demon all along. Wait, so is it a demon or is it someone? Is it a guardian angel of your baby protecting them from SIDS? <laughs> Come on, make up your mind, girl. She seems kind of unemotional in the documentary, unlike Tony, who is tearing up and getting goosebumps just talking about various things that happened to him. Number 8. The Neighbor Kate Peltzer's tale of having bricks dropped on her and a team of investigators was quite weird as she said there were no handy bricks but nearby the walls were stone, the ceiling was wood and there was nowhere for a random brick to fall from. She did say though that the bricks were only dropped when the lights were turned out. 
It's rather convenient, no? Her son, having nightmares and pointed to a monster flying around his room, can easily be discounted as childish fears. So sorry, Kate, I'll need a bit more convincing than that. Yeah, it's like, why is he scared of a monster? Because you told him there are monsters. He's a kid. Why would you just... It's not haunted. Haunting's not real. That's the sort of thing you... When your kid's like, there's a ghost in my room, be like, no, it's not. Ghosts aren't real. Even if you believe in ghosts because something's wrong with you, just say they're not real because it'll make your kid feel better, okay? Don't be like, it's a friendly ghost. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're just lying. Things I can't explain. Enough of the doubting, let's talk about some of the genuinely odd things that the Pikmins experienced. In Season 3, Episode 1 of, Sight of a Sightings episode called Heartland Ghost, we see many examples of photos, usually of their baby, with weird blue patches over parts of the picture. There's also blurry areas and strange light blotches present. I know photos can easily be faked, overexposed, etc., but only part of these pictures are affected, and would the couple be doing this right at the beginning of their stay at the Sally House without knowing the alleged backstory? The one expert featured on the show could couldn't give a satisfactory explanation for how these weird pictures could have been made. Okay, fair enough. But also, you're a show about haunting, so your motivation to get an expert who's actually competent to disprove things is uh, is low. Is low. So you'll probably find someone who's like. <laughs> <laughs> What's your training? Oh, I uh, once developed photos at a Kodak machine. <laughs> you know, expert. There's no motivation. It's, there's so much. Like me, I am dispassionate. Like I am waiting. I'm happy to be proven right. I'm happy to like see things. I'm very skeptical, but I am open to proof. Whereas this show is like, well, if we just push it towards too much skepticism, people are going to not watch because our show is for people who believe in this stuff. It's a huge conflict of interest. Also, what the hell's going on with Tony Pickman and his scratches? Although I haven't seen it myself, there's apparently a nine-minute section of uncut footage where you see scratches start forming on his body with no outside interference. I did try to find this, but, but only found other people looking. There is a part in the sightings episode where you hear him cry out and the crew rushes over to see some bleeding cuts on his upper arm, but this could have been faked, as we don't see what he was doing beforehand. His wife just admonishes the ghost of Sally and doesn't seem particularly bothered one way or the other. She also presses a paper towel to the cuts, but it doesn't look like any blood is cleaned off. The burning stomach hair that we mentioned earlier is also a bit strange. We're being told what we're supposed to be seeing and smelling by Michael Esposito. The film quality is not very high, and sometimes I think I can see hair being burned away, and other times I'm not sure. I did watch it several times. If Tony was self-inflicting these scratches, or if Deborah was doing it, they really went to town, as there are photos of his chest with a shed load of nasty red scratches all over it, like it had been mauled by a really disgruntled cat. He gets them on his back too, which would be very hard to self-inflict, never mind in a surreptitious manner. Yeah, I still think they're self-inflicted, or his wife did it, or it's anything but ghosts. <laughs> That's right, I said it! Conclusions So, after all is said and done, I have no real idea what to think. I don't know when the whole Sally dying during an appendectomy story started, and really, appendectomies weren't in your average doctor's playbook in 1906, so if Sally really did exist, she was pretty screwed from the start. It seems the urban legend behind the hauntings grew from information given out by psychics. Barbara Connor was the first person to suggest the name Sally, and that wasn't until 1993, some time later. So maybe that whole backstory just evolved and was embellished until it became what it is today. Only, it's really not as scary when you realize it's only 30 years old. The Pikmins, although they used pseudonyms in the sightings show, got some level of notoriety and presumably money from the whole experience, and even though they lived there less than two years, they've gone back multiple times since with various TV crews, usually to Tony's detriment. Deborah also wrote that book, and their experiences have brought thousands of tourists, psychics, and amateur ghost hunters to 508 North 2nd Street. If we believe in the presence of ghosts in the house, we have to assume the spirits were either dormant or not particularly nasty until over 80 years later. Oh, and the Pikmins moved in, as the fact is, there was no bars about the house at all before they took up residence. I'm not sure if the ghostly activity continued after they're gone either. There are no other families linked to the story, so maybe Sally just went to sleep again. There's probably someone. Does anyone know? Anyone live in this town who's watching this? Anyone know what's there these days? Is there some random family just living there? Just that would just be like, can you leave us alone? Just trying to live in a house. It's just a normal house. I pay my rent. Leave me alone. Why can't you just? I'm a bit bothered about Deborah Pickman's change of heart. While she was uh, living in the Sally house, she just seemed to put up with the ghostly occurrences and treated Sally as a member of the family. Over ten years after she moved out, she wrote a book about her experience, mentioning that she thought her baby was protected by Sally, etc. What then changed? A few years later, she suddenly started saying that Sally was a malevolent demon disguised as a little girl. Was it just that people were losing interest in the story, so she threw in a new angle? What? Could it be that, Katie? Yes. <laughs> 
allegedly. There was a couple of Sally House websites referencing the book and on Deborah's Facebook page, but neither of them are currently up and running. Really, the main beneficiary of this story is Les Smith, the owner of the Sally House. Apparently, he still owns it today, and you'll be excited to hear that you can go and see the Sally House for yourself and even spend the night there if you wish. Okay, there we go. That's what's happening to the house today. He's found a way that's more profitable than tenants. Hey, it worked. All right. Easy money. Come on. It's currently $125 per person or a bit more during Halloween season, but you're not allowed to go in the basement. Boo hoo. Some people say they felt and experienced things, others say nothing happened at all. I suppose the way, only way to convince yourself one way or the other would be to go and spend the night there. But for me, I don't get paid expenses, and to be honest, I'm not that bothered. <laughs> it's like nothing's gonna happen, it's not real. Sorry, Sally. If you go and check it out, make sure Les isn't hiding around the corner next to a stack of old bricks you'll probably be fine yes you'll be fine ghosts aren't real <laughs> entirely unconvincing episode thank you for being here nonetheless if you enjoyed it smash that like button make sure you subscribe if you're watching on uh sorry if you're listening as a podcast leave me a review that'd be grand and i'll see you next time